For my first ever book review on YouTube, I'm tackling The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant by Stephen R. Donaldson. In fact, I'm reviewing all three of the Chronicles, spanning 10 books and more than 5,000 pages, or 255 hours of audiobook listening if you prefer. If reading a series of that size daunts you because of the time commitment involved, I'm here to tell you why you can skip at least half of it. I'm Bridger, and welcome to the Library Ladder. The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever is one of the foundational epic fantasy series of the genre. It's also one of the most polarizing. This is the first part of a three-part video review, with each video focused respectively on the first, second, and final chronicles in the series. In this video, I'm discussing the first chronicles. My introduction to the Thomas Covenant saga happened more than 40 years ago. I was about 11 and had recently discovered Middle-earth and Dungeons and Dragons and was binging my way through all the epic fantasy books I could lay my hands on. I happened to notice a trilogy of books on a display table at my local library. Lord Falsbane, The Ill-Earth War, and The Power That Preserves. What really grabbed me was the cover art and the epic scale it conveyed, especially that of the third book, which completely altered my conception of what a medieval castle or keep could look like. Published as a complete trilogy in 1977, the first chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever ignored many conventional fantasy tropes and established precedents that many authors today are still emulating. At first blush, the series seems to fit the traditional fantasy mold. The main character, Thomas Covenant, is a basically ignorant and helpless protagonist from our world who is thrust without a choice through a magical portal into a life or death quest in the face of insurmountable odds to defeat an evil Dark Lord. However, Donaldson did something very different with Covenant that has become much more common in recent years. You see, Covenant's not your typical naive Gary Sue paragon of innocent goodness. Instead, he's a morally flawed anti-hero with a severe personality disorder. Does that sound like a lot of the grimdark protagonists authors are creating these days? Covenant's not a likable guy. He's rude, bitter, inconsiderate, and self-absorbed. And to really drive the point home, he's also a leper. Yes, you heard that correctly. He has leprosy, which has made him an outcast, shunned by everyone in his life, including his wife and infant son. At this point, if you haven't already read the books, you might be wondering why you'd ever want to if it means spending extended time with such a miserable character. The answer, for me at least, is that Donaldson surrounds Covenant with an amazing supporting cast of characters and places them all in a richly conceived world called The Land. I've read this trilogy four times over the past four decades, and each time I tolerate Covenant, but I absolutely love The Land and its inhabitants. Now, it's important to note also that although there is plenty of plot and action in this first trilogy, the story is really more character-driven than plot-driven, unlike many fantasy novels where plot is king. Much of the story arc is propelled by Covenant's stubborn refusal to believe in the land and in the people and experiences he encounters there. Fortunately for the reader, over the course of the three books, Covenant's personality has some of its rough edges worn away as a result of his experiences and interactions with the inhabitants of the land. He never truly becomes likable, but he does become a much more sympathetic character. This series has something of a love it or hate it reputation, and I can understand both viewpoints. I happen to love this first trilogy, and I consider it essential reading in the fantasy genre, but I also recognize that it has its frustrating and disturbing aspects, not least of which is Covenant himself. I think readers' expectations going into this series may play a significant role in whether or not they enjoy it. I entered the series for the first time expecting heroic epic fantasy replete with swords and sorcery. And although the series has all of those elements, I realized in hindsight that it's better to think of the series as a tragedy due to the many, often thankless, sacrifices made on Covenant's behalf by the people and other beings he encounters in the land. 
Covenant isn't truly the hero of this story, despite the centrality of his role. Instead, the heroes are Banner, Lena, Lord Mora, Saltheart Foam Follower, and the many others who unselfishly aid him along the way, often to their detriment. I'll note also that the third book in the series, The Power That Preserves, is the first book that ever made me cry. It's an epic fantasy. It's also a tragedy. It's frustrating and problematic. It also packs a tremendous emotional wallop, such as whenever the giants of Sea Reach are involved. Read the first Chronicles and find out why it's rightly considered a classic that has influenced many other authors over the past several decades. I highly recommend this trilogy. It's a very rewarding read, despite its flaws, and it features an early and iconic anti-hero of the fantasy genre. I'll be continuing my review in two more videos that discuss the sequels to this first Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. I'll provide links to them in the video description text below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please click the like button or post something in the comments section. Please also consider subscribing to this channel by clicking on the library ladder icon in the bottom right corner. Thanks for watching.